preparing to okay uh, there is some recording okay got it yeah sorry uh yes i just uh, want to say that i was a bit scared to give this presentation after the two fantastic talk like that we had just before mine but hopefully i will be more on the speculative and uh close to philosophical uh, ground, so that will be quite different. And yes, I will exp explain Autotelic very soon. But first, I will start from uh, Martin's introduction yesterday morning. He said that we want robots that are useful in everyday life. Okay, And I will start by the, the, the idea that there is some paradox when we want an agent to be both autonomous and useful. I will explain this. And building on this paradox together with, with colleagues, we wrote a position paper explaining that to solve the paradox, we need to have agents that are autotelic, I will explain it, but also teachable. And if we are interested in having agents that we can teach, we figured out that uh, there is one property that is missing in most uh, existing agents, with, which is the inferential social learning uh, capability. So I will explain this. Okay, then I will explain what inferential social learning uh, really means. And then I will present a formal framework to account for these uh, properties. And I will just uh, go quickly through our contributions in this um, recent domain, let's say, and maybe go back to more uh, speculative uh, work in the end. So um, let's start with the autonomous versus, versus useful paradox. So imagine you have an agent, okay, a robot. Let okay, th there won't be any robot in my in my talk, but uh, the, the the robot is the target, and I will just speak of agent uh, and, uh, so far. So imagine uh, you have an agent in in that particular kitchen, uh, and imagine you have a, you want to have an agent which is autonomous. So to be uh, specific. Autonomous comes from Greek. It means that uh, that's an agent who design its own rules. Okay, and to avoid this very complicated term, we design with colleagues um, Pierre Evodeyer, Cédric Collat, etc. Another notion which is autotelic, which means able to address its own goals. Okay, telos is goal. So an autotelic agent is an agent that sets and learns to pursue its own goals, okay? And if you have some autotelic agent in, in front of this kitchen, you would like it to be able to learn uh, new goals uh, forever. That's the so-called open-ended learning capability. That's clearly a capability that we have to invent new goals forever, okay? Uh, but the point is that you would also want this robot to do just use useful things, okay? And if your robot is seriously autonomous, if it's just inventing its own rules, it may do a lot of useless or unwanted things. For instance, you may learn to throw dishes as far as possible, and you don't want your robot to do that, of course, okay? So from one side, you want we want the robot to be fully autonomous, but if we want to be it to be useful, either we control the autonomy or we have to find something else. And in fact, there is a situation where we have autonomous agents that we manage somehow to do useful things. That's the case of our children, okay? We learn, okay, we can educate them, so we teach them so that they will do things that are finally useful for society and not so unwanted things uh, in in home and in, in life in general, okay? So somehow we need some social control over the goals of autonomous or autotelic agents, okay? And the idea is that social partners may teach useful and desired goals. So our point with colleagues is to find a way to teach agents uh, so that they will have interesting uh, learning trajectories. So we designed in uh, that paper with colleagues towards teachable autotelic agents a uh, framework where you have uh, first an autotelic agent. So that's an agent that will sample its own goals and learn how to pursue and to achieve these goals. Uh, but then we combine it with a teachability property, 
where and there can be an external teacher or an external uh, social partner, let's say, that can suggest goals and the agent may choose either to achieve its own goal or to choose the goals from the social partner. And if you think of it, uh, this could be a very important capability to drive robots towards uh, useful goals, but that's also a way to help solve the open-ending learning challenge because social partners can suggest new goals um, by showing, by asking the agent to do things, by telling you could do this, things like this, okay? So if we want to achieve this goal to have both teachable and autotelic agents, uh, what we want to do is to get inspired by the way humans uh, teach to each other. So we are, we want to get inspired by human social learning mechanisms. Okay. And that's how we went to this idea of inferential social learning. Okay. So what's inferential social learning? That's a notion that was proposed quite recently by Yogweon in that particular paper. And she sets the following definition. Inferential social learning aims to characterize the interaction between two agents, so the teacher and the learner, as the result of mutual ment mental state reasoning and planning. Okay. And to model these things, she put forward that uh, there are basic components that are needed, which are Bayesian inference, the capability to model the partner, and some rationality assumptions. So I will go back to these components later on. But first, I will explain the idea with a few examples. So that's examples um, taken from the paper, where she's just describing what's happening with, between uh, human agents. OK. Uh, so for instance, if uh, you have a demonstrator uh, where there is a box with yellow and blue things, and the demonstrator just fix blue things and show that they squeak, the child seeing the demonstration will infer by itself that the yellow things do not squeak. Okay. Uh, another example is that if a demonstrator shows one property of a complicated toy, the infant will infer that this toy has just one property. Otherwise, probably, the teacher would try to be maximally informative and, and would demonstrate uh, other properties. But if now the, the infant knows that some object has several properties, several capabilities, for instance, and the teacher only shows one, then there are two options for that, for the, that child. Either he thinks that the teacher is inform under informative, or they think that the teacher knows that they already know that the, that the toy has other functions, okay? So you can see that with these inference mechanisms, if you have some model of what the other, um, the social partner knows and does not know or thinks or believes, etc., you can have a powerful inference mechanism to um, decide what's really happening by interpreting these social signals and the context. So previous knowledge about what you know about the other agents. Okay, and okay, so we that's the, the, the general idea of inference social learning. And then in our uh, paper, we performed a kind of survey of different areas of um, autonomous agent learning. Okay, so interactive reinforcement learning, autotelic learning, social inference learning. Okay, and we uh, listed a few properties that are expected from children, and we more or less showed that inference social, social learning mechanisms are the ones that, has the, that are the most poorly covered in the current artificial intelligence literature. So that's why we decided to try to model these things and to try to publish on that domain, because we believe it would be nice to have robots and agents able to uh, infer from interaction with a human the way children uh, do. So I will now continue with the formal framework that, uh, okay, that's not exactly our formal framework, but uh, I will just show that uh, it's uh, developed based on another one, okay. Uh, but first, I have just to, I just need a short reminder about what's Bayesian inference for those in the audience who would not know. So the idea is that 
uh, we are in a context where we may uh, observe some data and this data by, by be based on some hypothesis, okay? And here, if I have in blue what is known and in white what is determined, uh, what has to be determined, in the causality case, you know the hypothesis, and then you must determine what, what would be the, resu the resulting data, okay? But in Bayesian inference, you observe the data and you want to determine what are the underlying hypotheses, okay? And that's very easy to do one when you know about the other one, okay? Just through a Bayes formula. That's the general idea. And let's say that uh, the, this inference mechanism is also called inverse planning, for instance, in that, in that paper, uh, because that's uh, something that uh, you find a lot in the papers that I will mention uh, after all. After this one, uh, after this slide, sorry. So um, now I have the elements to present a global framework to account for the inferential social learning uh, phenomena. First, I will have a demonstrator and an observer. Okay, and I will take the most complicated case of the demonstrator when the demonstrator wants to be pedagogical. Okay, and that's demonstrator. We may have some beliefs about the world. He may have some goals that he wants to be achieved in the real world, but it may also has some have some goal uh, which is directed towards belief of the observer. Okay, he wants the observer to believe something. He may also have some model of the observer, and based on all these elements the demonstrator may have a policy that will generate some demonstration, okay? And that demonstration would be um, designed so that the observer will believe something and that some uh, instrumental goal will be achieved, okay? On the other side, we have the observer that will observe the demonstration from the demonstrator and may have a model of the demonstrator. And based on... Uh, uh, oh, did I call this before? Inverse planning, sorry. Uh, the observer, and based also on his own policy, may infer the belief directed goal of the demonstrator, also the instrumental goal and the word belief. So that's a very general framework. Okay. And the idea is that the pedagogical demonstrator will act so as to influence the beliefs and the goal of the observer based on some model of this observer. And the pragmatic observer will infer the instrumental and belief directed goals and eventually the world belief from the demonstrator based on a model of the demonstrator. Okay, so that's a very general framework that you can use with Bayesian inference mechanisms that I've shown uh, just before. Okay, and let me say that this model is just an extension of a model proposed in that particular paper. Uh, I want to show you that with this model, you can account for the idea that somebody is thinking that the other one is thinking that the other one is thinking, etc., etc. So you can uh, uh, get some recursion in what is called theory of mind. So I took my demonstrator. Here I have a model of the observer. So I replace this by the model of the observer that, that you had on the previous slides. And then in this model of the observer, there is a model of the demonstrator, etc., etc. So you, by this way, you can have a recursion, okay? And this allow you to account for the fact that the observer thinks that the demonstrator thinks that the observer thinks, etc., etc. Okay. But if you want to plan with that particular uh, recursive model, then you need some approximate reasoning framework or some early stopping cri uh, criterion in the recursion. Otherwise, of course, you will have to infer for an infinite time, okay? And that these aspects are covered in those two papers. Let me say also that uh, in Mark O's work, and the, the previous model is from Mark O, uh, I told you that we were needing uh, three elements. One was Bayesian inference. One was a model of the partner. And the third was some rationality assumption. And about the rationality assumption, we need something to interpret the behavior uh, of the other partner. And the semantic to interpret behavior in that particular framework is given by the optimal decision-making framework. So the, we, it's based on the assumption that the, the, the other agent is trying to maximize some utility. OK, 
Okay. And in the case of Marco's work, he's using standard reinforcement learning. So this utility that is maximized just derives from an external reward signal. Whereas if we have autotelic agents, then the utility will come from achieving the goals of the agent uh, itself. Okay. And deciding on a particular utility will be a key modeling decision to account for these uh, inference mechanisms. So a few glimpses at our contributions in the domain and then uh, more speculative, speculative work. Okay. So first we started from a work uh, that is a seminal work in uh, developmental psychology from the group of uh, Jerome Brunner that's called the role of tutoring in problem solving. That's a lot cited paper more than uh, 15,000 times, okay. And in that particular paper, the authors show um, quite convincingly that uh, there is a tutor showing children how to do things. And they state that in these uh, interactions, there was not a single instance where the children was performing blind matching behavior. It means that the child was not reproducing exactly what the teacher was showing. Okay, so in terms of artificial intelligence, uh, we saw the term in several um, talks before. That would be the I would translate that, translate this but by the fact that the learning agent is not performing behavioral cloning on the on the teacher's um, trajectories definitely, and so we wanted to explain uh, the, the, this fact that in fact. Uh, an agent can infer the goal of the other agent so as to produce its own trajectory based on its own knowledge and of on what the teacher is showing. So for that, we special, specialize the general framework that I've shown you uh, before uh, as follows. First, we have two kinds of demonstrator. One is naive. So it's just having an instrumental goal and it performs a policy that uh, provides a demonstration on how to solve the goal, but without taking care of the beliefs of the learner. And then we have the pedagogical teacher, which has also some belief directed uh, goal and some uh, model of the observer. Actually, in that particular case, the model will be the teacher's own policy. So that's a very simplified case. Okay. And we have also two kinds of learners. One is the literal learner, which will just infer the goal from the demonstration without any idea of the teacher being uh, pedagogical. And the other one is the pragmatic learner, which based on some model of the demonstrator will try to infer what, the, what goal the, the demonstrator was trying to convey and also what was his belief directed goal. And this kind of uh, framework can be used to deal with the fact that in any demonstration, what's the final goal is always ambiguous. Okay, and I will uh, exemplify this uh, just after that. And a word to say that at the heart of the work that I will present to you, there, there is a Bayesian goal inference mechanism, which works as follow. In fact, those agents have goal condition policies Okay, and if you think of it, the goal condition policy will provide the probability of demonstration given some goals. And Bayesian goal is Bayesian goal inference, sorry, we do the contrary. So it will provide the probability of some goals given demonstration from that policy. Okay, so now the example. Okay, so we took the case where we have a teacher and a learner, and there are some blocks. And for instance, the teacher want to put the blue uh, block close to the green one, okay? If it does it this way, it's very ambiguous whether it is trying to put the blue block close to the uh, green one or to the red one. But if it does this this way, okay, it's clearer for the learner that the teacher is trying to show how to put the blue block close to the green one. Okay, and so we managed to perform some model uh, with this. So first we had a naive teacher 
choosing any way to get the objective done without taking care about this ambiguity. And we have a pedagogical teacher which uses Bayesian goal inference. So it's using its own policy to determine whether its demonstration will be more or less ambiguous for the learner. Okay, just by tr trying to figure out what's the probability of the different goals given the demonstration it is giving and choosing the demonstration that will maximize the probability that the correct goal is inferred. Okay. And on the other side, we have the learner who, who does more or less the same. So it's inferring the goal using Bayesian goal inference from the demonstration of the teacher. And given the goal, it will try to reproduce it. Okay. And the idea is that the pedagogical teacher will be rewarded if the learner correctly infers the goal, so we are using this autotelic reinforcement learning uh, semantics, okay, and the learner will be rewarded for inferring, inferring the right goal and reaching it. Okay, that's again the same semantics. Okay. I will skip a lot of details about this, but what we showed finally in this paper is that in the case where there are only 100 demonstrations, the fact of combining pedagogical demonstrations and pragmatic inference is much more robust to fewer demonstration than the case where you just have the naive and the literal uh, teacher and learn. Okay. And so finally, we, we could show that with that particular model, the pragmatic learner does not blindly imitate what the teacher chose. It infers the goal and then provides its own way to achieve the goal. Okay. And okay, the side effect is that with this work, we were using goal condition reinforcement learning. So we could account for the fact that the learner was um, building its own expertise on how to achieve the goal uh, while inferring the, the goals themselves. Okay. But there were some uh, important limitations to, the, to that work. First, the, the point is that the teacher was trained first to provide pedagogical demonstrations completely independently of any learner. So there was no possibility to adapt the teacher to a particular learner. And so we wanted, and that will be the, the, the topic of the next work that I will present to you, uh, we wanted the teacher to build the model of the learners and to adapt its pedagogy to particular learner. That's what uh, the full framework would show, because if the teacher has some model of the learner and is not using its own model, then the optimal pol policy that we will find will be dependent on the particular model of the particular learner it is trying to, do, to teach. Okay. Uh, okay, so that's the second party we wanted. That's the second part, sorry. Um, we wanted to undo our teacher with some theory of mind about the learner and uh, vice versa. So for that, we started for, uh, um, again, an experimental uh, developmental psychology work from uh, Yogweon and, and uh, co-authors, where the, the setup is the following. There is a toy with 20 buttons, and only three of the buttons are displaying music. Okay, and when a teacher is presented with an infant that has not played with the toy before, it will show all the buttons. But if the infant had the opportunity to play uh, with the toy before, the teacher will only press the three buttons that display music. The idea is that the teacher will think that the learner already knows that some buttons are not doing music. So he thinks that the learner will infer that the teacher is only showing the three buttons that are displaying music. That would not be the case if the learner has no uh, previous experience with that particular toy. So we managed to make a model of that using the same framework uh, as before, but I won't give the details this, this time because I want to shorten a little bit my, my talk. Uh, we reproduced the, the, this ID. So we had one demonstration on the environment um, where the teacher is just observing the learner so as to determine what kind of learner it's observing. Okay. And then it builds a model of the learner in of its beliefs. So there are different learners with different beliefs about the, the buttons. 
and the teacher will select the demonstration with the highest utility for the learner so that the learner will learn as efficiently as possible what should change in its policy so as to use the toy the most efficiently as possible. Okay. And we could account for the teacher's behavior. And recently, we have extended that uh, toy experiment with a slightly more challenging world. one. We are using the mini-grid environment where you have agents that should navigate between rooms and collect keys to open doors. Okay. And the idea is that the teacher will be confronted to different learners whose goals are different. Some of them have to uh, collect the purple key and open the purple door and other ones, the green one. And they also have different uh, vision fields. So the teacher should infer the vision fields of the learner based on the observed behavior. And then they perform a demonstration that will help the learner determine where is the goal that they are trying to achieve and uh, and optimize their, their performance. Okay. That's uh, work that is currently under uh, review. And okay, we could, uh, for instance, monitor the beliefs of the teacher about the learner when observing the learner and show that, for instance, in this situation, the teacher would first infer that the learner is trying to go to the green door or the green key, but finally it's changing its mind when at some point the teacher is moving away from that particular door. I won't go into the details. There is a nice blog post uh, about this work where you can have uh, more general idea about this. A third topic that we started to address is the idea that's again in the Brunner's paper that I have told you about, that uh, it's more effective to perform demonstration for younger kids and then to use language for uh, older kids. Okay. And we wanted to reproduce this idea that uh, we could select different policy based on the capabilities of the learner and the teacher. Okay. Uh, and again, we use the same Bayesian optimization framework as before. And again, I, I won't go into the details, but we show that it's um, more efficient to give instructions. No, that's the contrary, to give the demonstration than instructions uh, as uh, expected in the, in the particular paper. Okay, I wanted also to point the fact that we are not the only ones to start to investigate the relationship between uh, sensory motor demonstrations and language. So again, I want I don't want to spend too much time, so I will just point to that particular work. What is interesting is that they show that language is more efficient when the game that the learner should solve has more complex rules. And and, the, and it's more efficient to give demonstrations for simple ones. And the general idea is that language uses abstract features, whereas a demonstration just shows a unique instance. So it's easier to infer the correct abstract rules when you are using language. And it's easier to determine exactly what to do when you are using just a demonstration. Uh, OK. So a few speculative remarks about this. Uh, of course, we have seen a lot during these two days that there is a lot of uh, excitement about large language models. And so we weren't interested in this idea that uh, we could go further about the, the theory of mind by trying to design some uh, language-based theory of mind. Actually, we were inspired by this paper where the authors show that a theory of mind is used essentially to infer the right plan in front of a novel situation by contrast with using habitual behavior and statistical learning. Okay. And the idea is that why do we need that why do we need a theory of mind in this novel situation? In fact, the idea is that we need to manipulate abstract representation to generalize to unseen situation uh, given previously seen situations. So this leads to the idea that to manipulate this abstract representation, a language is the most obvious tool, okay. Uh, but there is some issue about this that I wanted to mention, which is that uh, some non-verbal animals like crows and a few, okay, a few birds and a few primates um, display 
some evidence of having a theory of mind, whereas they don't have a complicated language as uh, ours. Okay. And also this, there is this idea that you may need language to acquire a theory of mind, but you may also need a theory of mind to acquire language that's um, developed in that particular paper. So we would need to go to these questions with a more developmental perspective, where instead of having a ready-made large language models and a ready-made theory of mind, we would be interested in how to build a theory of mind based on the language and to build language understanding based on the theory of mind. I also wanted to mention the fact that if we have an agent equipped with some language-based theory of mind, that's very useful for having an explainable agent because the agent could be able to develop a linguistic interpretation of its own behavior in terms of its belief, its goal, etc., which is what uh, human people tend to use. Okay, We tend to say, I did this because I wanted that and I thought that, etc., etc. So long as an agent with some theory of mind could use a language-based theory of mind to explain what it's currently doing. Okay. And finally, to conclude this uh, talk, uh, I wanted to go back to uh, an even more recent paper from uh, Yo Guéan, where she suggests that uh, artificial intelligence research should be interested in, in her inference social learning framework, which is uh, what I tried to, to show you uh, during this talk. But the, she has a quite good argument, I believe, which is that if we want to have machines that we can teach, then these machines should behave as human learners. So they should be endowed with inferential social learning capabilities. But also, if you want to have teaching machines, which is also a very interesting uh, case, then these machines should behave as human teachers, and they should have inferential social learning capabilities too. And that's it for my talk. And OK, a, a word about my collaborators uh, on, on that particular line of thought. Thank you very much. Um, thanks a lot, Olivier, for the presentation, and we have time for a few questions, if any, and I can start with one. <laughs> um, I was wondering if beyond the, this teacher-learner interaction scenario that you have, your framework could be used more generally for dialogue, where dealing with ambiguity is, is a challenge, and so having a way to model the beliefs of the agent uh, or the belief of the human uh, for the agent would help to reduce this, uh, this ambiguity. So did you think of some applications that are beyond this teacher-learner uh, um, uh, context, uh, more general in dialogue? Yes, definitely. Uh, I believe that this general uh, Bayesian inference framework can be applied to cooperation and to, for instance, uh, information search or the, the, this kind of stuff where you have an, an agent interacting with, with a human. Okay, so we, this morning, you had a talk by Laure Soulier, and Laure is about a lot interested in uh, information retrieval, and we started to discuss with uh, Mohamed Chetwani and Laure to see whether we could um use these Bayesian inference tools in the context uh, of interaction, language interaction, language based interaction between an agent and a human. Yes. Okay, thanks. We do have time for additional questions. I don't know if there are some questions online. I don't have access to the chat. Uh, one. Okay, you can. Uh, bonjour Olivier, c'est Gérard Bailly à l'appareil. Um, je, I, uh, you know, I, I have to ask in, in English. Yes. Um, if you want, in fact, the agent to to be able to perceive, in fact, uh, intention of the uh, of this uh, interlocutor, you have to also to incorporate in the policy of uh, of uh, signal generation um, the ability uh, to to give the opportunity to give for free the opportunity to the to the, to, the, to, the, to the observer, in fact, to decode or to, uh, to give access to intentions. So it should be part, in fact, of the, uh, of the uh, it's, it's a, somehow, somehow uh, an additional uh, 
um, constraint on the policy of generating uh, signals because at the end uh, the robot has to act so to to have uh, somehow re readable uh, behaviors Yes, and actually, this is exactly what emerges with our framework. That that was the point of the the Brunner work that uh, teachers they show how to do things, but they don't don't do it the same way if they are doing the the, the things on their own. They do things, and at the same time, they show how to do things. Okay, and the idea is that that Bayesian goal inference mechanism can explain this. Okay, it explains how to how you perform a demonstration while at the same time choosing the demonstration that will convey convey the most information about what you are really intending. Okay, and the idea is that the, with this framework, the teacher can infer what's the most pedagogical demonstration, and with the same framework, the observer can infer what was the goal of the teacher and uh, perform the same. Uh, act in a different way. So I, I believe that's the key capability of this framework to explain this idea that when you are doing things, there is an intention be behind the thing. And one intention is related to doing things in the real world. And the other intention is to convey some communication, some message to the one who is observing you. More questions? I have another one. You mentioned at the beginning of your uh, uh, presentation the need for social control over the goals of agents. And I was wondering if this is you consider this is similar to the AI alignment in general, or you see some subtle differences between AI alignment and what you call the social control over goals? Uh, I'm not sure I know enough about the literature about AI alignment to answer pro properly to your questions. But yes, the, the, the general idea is that finally we should teach these agents more or less the way we teach kids. That's funny because that's uh, written close to this way in Alan Turing's paper, the seminal one uh, from uh, the 1950. He says that the best way to reach at artificial intelligence would be to educate um, the artificial intelligence as we would do with the normal teaching of a child. And the, the specific words are the normal teaching of a child. Okay, And yes, probably if we do so, somehow at some point, we will try to teach these agents the way we teach kids. If we want them to have the same social norms as we do, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, thank you for the answer. Um, do we have, we have time for a last question, if any? Yes. Um, so I'm wondering if um, in the most scenarios, maybe also when we teach kids, don't we also say the goal that we want? Like I say, hey, we do this for that, and then I show. So um, I guess that a lot of cases we actually can give directly the goal also often there might not be a need to inferring it I'm yeah there are many studies that show that uh, that that's not exactly your point but uh, you know there are many instruction following agents and in fact in developmental psychology many studies shows that uh, parents rather tend to describe their child what they are doing rather than instructing them to do things Okay, and the idea is that they help their children associate their actions with language, and this will help them infer what's the goal when something is said in conversation. But I'm not sure that we use you that we often specify what is the goal when we teach kids. Maybe more in classroom than in the family, but okay, I, I don't know that literature uh, well enough to give uh, an accurate answer. I think we can stop here. Thanks a lot, Olivier. Please thank the speaker again.